Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with James Orbinski on global health governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week I'm pleased to welcome here into the studio at the Center for International Governance Innovation, a noted expert on some aspect of international public policy or global governance. And this week I'm very happy to welcome James Orbinski, Thank the you. Balsley School's CG Chair of Global Health, also pref Professor of uh, in the School of International Policy and Governance at Wilfrid Laurier University and Director of the Africa Initiative here at CG. So uh, a man with that's, many titles. It's quite a mouthful. That's right. <laughs> so we have a lot to talk about, uh, but to get right to it, uh, global health governance. You're, you're a person who has experience in the field providing health in parts of the world that don't tend to have adequate provision for, for health services. So you've seen it from the micro end. You've been, uh, at least for a significant period of time, president of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, a major NGO attempting to provide health services in, in stricken, crisis-stricken areas. And now you have a chance to study it. Uh, how do you characterize and how do you currently understand this thing we call global health governance and, and where would you like to push the frontiers of our understanding of that here at the Balsley School? Well, it's, uh, if, uh, first of all, it's, it's um, uh, the idea of global health governance is, uh, it's a relatively new idea, uh, and it's a, a, an emerging field, an emerging discipline, um, and an emerging practice. Um, and um, it's driven by many, many factors, uh, primarily uh, the growing interdependence uh, of the world, uh, both economically and politically. Uh, but also um, uh, uh, shared problems or shared uh, problems of the commons, if you will. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, challenges like climate change, uh, challenges that um, affect all people uh, in slightly different ways depending on where they are, uh, but that affect all people uh, and that require all people and all nations uh, to engage in a meaningful response if there is going to be a meaningful response. Uh, other issues like emerging, re-emerging infectious diseases uh, are uh, problems, if you will, of the global commons, uh, and they require, uh, again, the sim a similar kind of approach. Uh, so um, today, in our vastly um, more interdependent world uh, uh, than it was even 50 years ago, um, uh, the issues that uh, require attention uh, are uh, certainly scientific, uh, they're certainly um, uh, technical uh, at some level, uh, but they're also deeply political. Uh, and uh, the way in which we approach uh, a problem, the way in which we define a problem, um, the political architecture, if you will, that we use to approach a problem and to define a problem, uh, really defines the range of possible solutions that can emerge. So. Um, attention to that process uh, is really front and center in terms of importance uh, when trying to achieve a viable, a meaningful, uh, and uh, an effective uh, policy outcome. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I've certainly been engaged and continue to be engaged uh, very practically uh, with um, the provision of health care and health care services. And so, for example, um, now I'm uh, deeply involved with uh, Dignitas International, which is a Canadian-based uh, non-government organization that I was involved in starting. And it's focused on health systems uh, in Malawi uh, and health systems that uh, attempt to uh, deal with the HIV epidemic and also deal uh, with concomitant uh, or related ep epidemics like tuberculosis uh, and other primary health care uh, issues, and that is a uh, that opportunity and, and that experience really uh, gives me a, a kind of a solid uh, um, basis, if you will, from which to to, to look at um, uh, the importance of, of of governance. And so, through that experience and working primarily in Mal in, in Malawi, um, one of the things that's absolutely clear uh, in terms of dealing with the HIV epidemic. Uh, is that this is a global governance issue uh, and it requires um, 
it requires a political approach to what traditionally has been seen as a technical, medical, public health uh, problem. Uh, and so governance and how we think about governance, how we define it, how we structure it, um, uh, is really central to, to, to achieving better health uh, mm -hmm. globally. And the other thing that I would say is that it's quite important to recognize that governance uh, is a broader term uh, uh, than, for example, government. Uh, and, um, and, and it is attractive to me, and um, I'm one of the main reasons that I've decided to really focus uh, on this, um, is, bec is because uh, it incorporates a recognition of both formal actors and informal actors. So states, for example, and then the various ministries and departments within states, whether it's the Ministry of Health or Foreign Affairs or whatever. Mm -hmm. So formal actors, and also uh, informal actors like non-government organizations, faith-based organizations, the private sector, uh, foundations, and so on, all of which are uh, in varying uh, configurations deeply, deeply important uh, in terms of actually defining uh, viable uh, approaches to problems of the commons, and, and particularly those that relate to health. Very good. So. Well, great start to our discussion, good. and we'll be back in just a minute with James Orbinski. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So James, you mentioned uh, the contrast between uh, health governance 50 years ago and health governance today, and there's at least two things you flagged already. One is now there's a wider variety of actors. Yeah. Uh, we've had just a few more states today. There are a few more states today than there were 50 years ago, but not that many more. A whole lot more uh, informal organizations, right. non-governmental organizations right. and other kinds of groups. The other thing you flagged was it's now more of a political enterprise than a technical medical enterprise. Right. Um, those both strike me as very important. When people talk about the effectiveness of global governance, they often immediately think about you know, the role of the UN, and then people often very quickly decide, well, among the great success stories of the UN is the WHO, the World Health right. Organization. Right. So would you say that the UN system and the WHO as the functional agency remains at the center of global health governance? Is it some kind of pivot around which much of right. the rest of it operates? Yeah. I mean, I think in a contemporary context, it's important to recognize that there are huge challenges huge challenges that as a global community we've never faced before. Um, and uh, the variety of actors is certainly much more diverse. And the skill level of, the, of uh, um, each of those actors uh, is variable, but generally much higher than it was even 50 years ago. Um, the nature of relationship, for example, between civil society and, and government and the, the state, if you will, uh, has fundamentally changed. Um, the provision of services, uh, the levels of expertise, where are the repositories of knowledge, for example. Uh, traditionally, uh, over the last hundred years, and just speaking very broadly, much of um, sort of deep science knowledge has been largely state-based. Mm -hmm. Now that has shifted uh, into um, uh, the public uh, domain, if you will, so into the private sector and into uh, civil society organizations. And with that, so too has competence and capacity to actually define a problem and deliver a problem. But one thing that hasn't changed, uh, and, and it's very important to recognize, um, is, is the centrality of formal legitimacy. So uh, states are uh, the final, if you will, imprimatur of legitimacy to a particular policy, law, or practice. Only states can um, uh, define formally and make formal a particular policy and can make formal or embody in law and practice, for example, a particular policy perspective. So states are, are vital and their institutions are vital. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, World Health Organization is an intergovernmental organization. It's an intergovernmental institution. And I think historically one can look at the WHO and say, yes, it has been enormously successful. Um, uh, in its political context of states. Mm -hmm. It has achieved great things. Um, and today, um, in my view, uh, it's absolutely central, uh, of central importance, that the WHO remain uh, 
the final imprimatur, if you will, of, of, of legitimacy to a particular policy or practice. The way it does that, the way it achieves um, the designation, if you will, of, of legitimacy around a particular policy or practice, that is changing and must continue to change. Mm -hmm. And that must adopt new governance uh, processes. Uh, and new, new approaches to uh, defining new knowledge, to defining uh, particular uh, practices and so on. But How is it changing? Is it opening itself up to non-state actors? Absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, um, to uh, non-government organizations, to foundations. Uh, so in the domain of health, global health, one of the, one of the, the most important found, uh, institutions uh, or actors, let's call it, uh, in the world is the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. Now that's a new phenomenon in, in relative terms. Excuse me, it, its resources are enormous. And where it chooses to focus, by definition, um, that focus becomes a focal point uh, for uh, activity, whether it's science or implementation or whatever around, around health. So it's extremely important that that institution, that organization, is properly engaged and that it is part of a broader dialogue and part of a process um, that um, uh, recognizes uh, priority needs, that also acts in relationship to other actors uh, and that um, achieves outcomes um, that um, are um, uh, both obviously effective but, but that are also in line with other activities uh, with other uh, policy initiatives, with other uh, outcomes through other actors so that you can actually uh, synergize, if you will, uh, activities mm -hmm. and outcomes. So this is, this, is a, uh, uh, this is process. This is all about process and it's all about the politics of that process. Uh, and tied in with, 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 with that process are uh, interests around um, better health, obviously, uh, also interests around uh, massive economic interests uh, around uh, health systems, who, who, who buys, who pays, and who gets access to health care. Uh, issues around intellectual property rights, for example. Um, uh, when we talk about drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, uh, um, the development of, 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 of health care technologies, uh, much of that development uh, is driven by uh, private sector uh, uh, activity uh, that uh, is rewarded through intellectual property rights. Um, and that's good. That's a, 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 a very, very powerful and important driver of innovation mm -hmm. uh, in terms of new knowledge and applications and so on. But there are, there, there's a whole range of other uh, needs um, that are outside of the market. Uh, the market's not interested in, for example, the diseases of poor people uh, who don't have, by definition, means to pay for goods or services, uh, and therefore does not uh, necessarily engage in appropriate R&D to address those needs. So uh, some other response, uh, other than a private sector response, is required. And so finding the right relationship um, between the actors, uh, the interests, uh, and the drivers uh, uh, of their activity uh, these are core governance challenges mm. and, and require um, uh, more than a, more than a, a uh, uh, let's just see how it goes kind of attitude. Um, uh, they require attention. They require a careful study. Uh, they require experimentation. They require evaluation. Um, uh, and, and that's the kind of, of, of activity uh, that we are engaging here uh, at the Basili School. Okay. Very good. We'll be back again in a minute with James Robinski. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So you've already indirectly referred to a third change in the last 50 years, which is um, Health care provision now is not just about treating disease. It's about a whole lot of prevention. It's a whole lot, about yeah. a whole lot of providing basic yeah. services such as clean water and adequate food and so forth so that people don't get sick in the first place. Uh, when you add sort of the broadening of the agenda to the uh, increased number of actors, 
Is there a danger of people working at cross purposes and sort of defeating each other in the course of, of doing their own thing? Or Absolutely. Actually, does it tend to work out pretty well on balance that, that more or less these efforts pull in the same direction, the synergies tend to wash out the, the clashes? Yeah. It's a very good question. Um, I mentioned the Gates uh, Foundation a moment ago. Um, the uh, overall, uh, I would have to say that, that um, given a balance, if you can ensure balance uh, in terms of power, uh, and, inter and power is not just uh, military, economic, or, or, or mm -hmm. uh, material, it's also ideas, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly science-based science, science -based ideas, very, very powerful, very important. But if you can, if you can ensure a relative balance in your, among, your, among the players, uh, then generally things do, um, at least in, in my view, kind of work out. Um, uh, you, there, there are appropriate checks and balances. But if there is a, uh, an imbalance uh, in power, uh, then um, the question of uh, um, uh, equity, uh, the, the question of uh, fairness, the question of respect for people's basic dignity, uh, all people's basic dignity, uh, the question of uh, can we achieve uh, a, um, a viable planetary future, um, um, th th that becomes less certain. And this again is why attention to governance is so important. So if you have, for example, a foundation like Gates uh, that has such huge power, um, if it is not related and, and uh, interdigitated, if you will, appropriately with other actors, then it can uh, um, uh, uh, get its agenda wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think actually Gates Foundation is a good example, a very good example, of how um, uh, uh, um, an actor with, with a significant power has, in my view, appropriately interacted and continues to appropriately interact with other actors in this broader landscape. Uh, uh, of actors that, that are engaged in, in, in global health. How would you characterize the role and how would you characterize the power of the recipients, the beneficiaries, the local Well, you see, th this, is, this is another, this is a very, very important shift that's taking place. Um, the idea that uh, there is a beneficiary right. uh, that uh, one uh, receives, one gives and another receives, this is fundamentally changing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is really, uh, uh, at some level, this is a very sort of charity-based conception uh, uh, of, right. of, of, of health and global health. Um, even you know, 10 years ago, that was very much the, the kind of base underlying assumption behind much international engagement uh, around global health issues. But that has changed even in 10 years. And the idea that there's a there's a, uh, a, a giver-recipient uh, uh, relationship, um, and that that's the way to go, uh, has very much, it is shifting, it's not complete, but it's starting to shift, uh, so that there is an interdependence, a recognition of interdependence, and a recognition of mutuality, and also a recognition that, in fact, my future really does depend on your well-being, uh, and uh, my well-being uh, is married to your future, so that it is, it, uh, even with disp disproportionalities in power, mm -hmm. that underlying assumption is, is, is very much starting to, to percolate into the discourse and into the way in which we think about, uh, about uh, governance. Um, How does that change play out on the ground at a fairly local level? How would you see things done differently now? close to 10 years ago based on this kind of change? Yeah, so I think, um, I'll give you two examples. One very, very concrete in terms of bench science. Um, when you're developing a vaccine uh, to, for example, H1N1, uh, a global uh, uh, pandemic uh, organism, um, or an organism with global pandemic uh, potential, let's call it. Uh, if you're gonna develop a vaccine to that organism, you need uh, uh, you need all of the genome. You need all of the, uh, the particulate uh, components to that vaccine. You can't just have some. Uh, so you need to, to, uh, to have the antigen, for example, from Thailand, uh, 
just as much as you need the antigen from the United States or from somewhere in continental Europe if you're going to develop a viable vaccine. If uh, the Thai uh, uh, community, the Thai government, does not want to give you access to that antigen, well, you can have the best science in the world, but without that antigen, you're not going to have a viable uh, vaccine. Um, the Thai government, for example, may make it conditional and say, look, I will give you the antigen that I have, but I need access to the vaccine at a fair and equitable price. And so very, very quickly, mm -hmm. the, the, the nature of relationship, uh, the interdependence of relationship uh, has fundamentally changed. Now, the Thai government is a capable government. It's a functioning Absolutely. state. Absolutely. A lot of countries don't have functioning states, failed or failing states that aren't really in a position to enforce those kinds of deals. What happens to people in those contexts? Do they need champions? Do they require external champions to step up and play that role? Yeah. Uh, they do. Uh, they also need support from within, uh, support to, to actors within uh, the state. Uh, there's no, I can't think of any country in the world uh, where there uh, isn't uh, at least a very significant viable uh, potential uh, for good governance and for, for good political leadership. Uh, and when you're in a, when you, I, when you are, when you have a situation like what you've described, uh, uh, an external champion is extremely important, uh, but so too is engaging uh, uh, internal potential uh, 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 leadership uh, and supporting that leadership uh, and um, uh, working uh, a situation uh, from with with both hands uh, to achieve the kind of outcome that mm -hmm. that, uh, that you're that you're looking for. Very good. We'll be back one more time with James Orbinski. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So in our last uh, few minutes, James, I'd like to talk about some of your particular areas of expertise and some of your um, responsibilities to the organization here in whose studio we're sitting, a director of the Africa Initiative, and you also have a specific interest now in furthering the understanding of climate change-induced um, health challenges. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to be doing uh, on those two files as you move forward? Well, I think uh, probably the, well, not probably, the most significant global health challenge today is climate change. Um, the Lancet, a top medical journal in the world, um, has recognized it as such. Um, the implications of um, the actuality of climate change today and then the future implications of climate change are profound uh, in terms of um, their effects on global health. Um, th through the Africa Initiative here at CG, uh, we are uh, in the process of, of realigning our program focus uh, around uh, the effects of climate change on global health. And we are uh, uh, looking at going to begin looking in detail under that rubric at the effects of uh, climate change on, for example, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, uh, on the incidence and prevalence of natural uh, disaster, the impact of disaster, natural disaster on uh, population health, uh, the impact of climate change on migration, uh, and then uh, the impact of climate change on uh, conflict. Uh, and um, this is a, an area where uh, there are already uh, huge impacts. And so, for example, uh, in the southern region of, uh, of Africa, uh, we're already seeing crop yields uh, diminish as a function of climate change. Um, the ex expectations, uh, according to some of the best estimates in the world, best models in the world, which aren't by definition perfect, um, uh, suggest that crop yields could fall by 50 percent uh, in the southern uh, region of Africa. Uh, and that uh, water stress or, or uh, issues around uh, uh, de uh, decreased access to potable water uh, could affect more than a billion people uh, uh, by, 20, by 2050. Um, so these, are, these are, are significant issues today and they are growing in their magnitude. Uh, and um, the way in which we approach uh, um, health uh, 
the way in which we approach uh, uh, mitigation strategies around, uh, uh, around climate change and the way in which we approach resilience strategies for communities and for, for nations um, uh, will have a significant impact in terms of uh, uh, just what will uh, the effects of climate change be on on uh, on health. So this is the kind of issue that, the kind of practical, if you will, issue that that we're really? we're looking to to uh, um, develop a capacity in. Is it safe to say that the single biggest effect of climate change on health will be through malnutrition, through? Well, it's actually not safe to say that. No. Um, the, I just read a study this morning um, that looked that tried to model the effect of climate change uh, on nutrition. Uh, in Africa uh, uh, and the developing world. And um, uh, there are many limitations to the model. Um, but the point is that it's, it, their conclusion was vastly different from, from uh, the conclusions of others, which would suggest exactly what you've said. Um, and their model is, is uh, it's a very good model, um, and it requires you know, careful methodologic uh, critique. But see, that's a, that's a very good example uh, of uh, what we do here. Uh, and, and a very good example of um, uh, the necessity of good research and the necessity of, of, of uh, highly skilled, competent analysis. Um, uh, these have, uh, uh, models have impacts. Uh, they, they, they affect how we see the world, how we think about our responses. Um, and the way in which we, we uh, define our response uh, uh, is deeply influenced by um, the systems that we use to project the future. Uh, so uh, being able to critically analyze them, being able to uh, understand the limitations of particular methods and so on, and being able to seek the best possible models mm -hmm. and seek excellence in our, in our research, um, this, this really has uh, uh, important kind of implications for, for, for what we actually do uh, as a global community. Uh, for our, our for our policy choices, uh, so um, it's you know that's a, a long answer, but it, it, it's it's not 100 percent clear uh, that the impact uh, uh, on morbidity and mortality of climate change will be greatest in in terms of food security uh, or nutrition. There will be an impact. There's no question, um, uh, but uh, we're not entirely sure. I, I would not be prepared to to, to say definitively yes. Uh, to that at this point. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the range of diseases that we tend to worry about when we think globally about health problems? Is that well, likely there's, to change? Yeah, or? yeah. So there's a, right now globally there's a massive shift. It's called the, the, the uh, uh, epidemiologic shift uh, from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. So now currently the, the largest proportion of morbidity and mortality globally is due to communicable or infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. And that's changing. Uh, to chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases, so diseases that are uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, um, diabetes, obesity, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, and so on. Um, that shift is 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 taking place, uh, and that's a function of the political economy that we live in, uh, and it's a function of the change in our political economy, uh, and um, it's important to understand. Uh, the nature of that shift. These uh, require quite a different health infrastructure to, to deal with, right? Absolutely, I mean. absolutely, sure. So uh, when we think about uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, obviously the best way to deal with a non-communicable disease is to prevent it, because they are preventable. Right. And so uh, uh, um, our built environments, for example, have a huge impact on, on obesity. Uh, our access to um, good food uh, have a huge impact on uh, our uh, on our basic health, on diabetes, on obesity, and uh, osteoarthritis, and so on. Um, uh, our access to, to public transit uh, has a huge impact. Uh, our uh, uh, approach to clean air uh, has a huge impact on cardiovascular disease, on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for example, uh, and so. Um, recognizing the shifts that are taking place and also recognizing the range of uh, possible options in terms of actually mitigating uh, disease or improving health. Um, these are also hugely important uh, global health issues. It's a very, very full agenda. Well, 
I hope we'll have you back and you can give us periodic updates on, yeah. on how things are going along the way. Well, thank uh, you. But welcome to the Balsley School. And thank you. To our audience, thank you for joining us and join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.